Right, now, now we move on to professional mode, hopefully. Um, and uh, what I'm going to be looking at today is uh, Ayrshire's ghost story. And I'm starting here with a little quote from Carl Jung, uh, himself a great believer in the supernatural. And he says, uh, we does not become enlightened by imagining figures of light, but by making the darkness conscious. Uh, and that's what I'm hoping to do today, to make us a bit more uh, conscious of the dark side. Uh, now, first of all, must confess, I am not a ghost hunter. Uh, and I'm not setting out to investigate, prove, disprove the existence of Ayrshire ghosts. I'm a historian by training, so I'm interested in uh, change over time. And the reason I look at ghosts is because ghost belief tells us a lot about uh, changes in religious belief, popular culture, uh, and social relationships. Um, and so I'm using ghosts really as guides as to how ordinary people experience these changes and try to make sense of them. So if I seem to be already, I'm, I'm talk, you know, talking about ghosts as realities, uh, that I'm doing that because that is how people uh, at the time saw them and how uh, people today uh, often still do. Now, Ayrshire's, Ayrshire's a great laboratory for studying ghosts. Uh, it's the reputation of being a haunted county. And there's various reasons for that. I think uh, some of it's just the landscape, the ruined castles, uh, the association with historical figures like uh, Wallace, Bruce, and of course also, as we'll be hearing about later in the conference, the supernatural poetry of uh, Robert Burns has helped that haunted reputation. But does it deserve it? Is Ayrshire really a haunted county? Well, there was a survey in 2021, and it ranked Ayrshire uh, as 10th equal uh, for hauntedness. Uh, it, it, it was uh, equal with Orkney, and it recorded 42 what it called supernatural events. Now, that was everything from UFOs to sea monsters. Um, it was actually the Highlands that came first, 209 um, supernatural events. Now, this survey, it was not, not scientific research. Um, it was sponsored by a camper van rental firm, okay, which might tell you something about the, the rigour of it. But it, I found it intriguing, and it encouraged me to step out of a comfort zone and probe a wee bit, a wee bit further. So for my own research, I've tried to be a bit more systematic. Uh, I drew on the, the widest range of sources, so uh, uh, supernatural anthologies, folklore compilations, newspapers, internet, of course, uh, and some interviews. And I also operated with quite a strict definition um, of, of terms. So ghost, in, in my uh, survey, is a, a manifestation of the dead before the living. And a haunting is the repeated appearance of a ghost in a certain location. So no sea monsters, I'm, I'm afraid. Um, and the result was 92 hauntings. Uh, most of them are modern, most continue into the present. Uh, but that is still a huge, huge understatement, I suspect, of the, the ghost stories uh, floating around Ayrshire. Um, there was a folklore study back in uh, 1942 in Warwickshire, uh, and it suggested that ghost sightings average one per square mile at that time. So if we um, apply that formula to Ayrshire, it would suggest there'd be over 1,100 local ghosts. So uh, one of the things I'd really like to do today um, is, is encourage you to send me your ghost stories, um, if you have any. But there are um, four questions today I'm going to try uh, and deal with. First of all, who are they? Who are these ghosts? Who are they? Why do they haunt us? And then finally, a wee bit at the end, do ghosts have a future in Ayrshire? 
And there's a couple of themes as well I, I should highlight that cut right across the paper. Uh, so I think I'll highlight these just now. The first thing you notice is the, the extraordinary persistence of ghosts, uh, or ghost belief, more correctly. The Reformation in Scotland, 1560, you would have expected ghosts to have been banished. Uh, they, they were identified as trappings of popish superstition. Um, but did they vanish? Not at all. Uh, ghost belief was deeply rooted amongst ordinary people. And by the 17th century, uh, and, uh, uh, Martha McGillan, who's got an excellent book uh, on this, uh, in Ghosts and Enlightenment Scotland, uh, she says that, well, at this point, we actually get leading Presbyterian religious thinkers uh, using ghosts as evidence of the soul and the afterlife. Um, the next century, another challenge to ghosts, triumph of scientific thought. So ghosts are dismissed as the product of disturbed minds. Um, but they're still not way to rest. Um, because a kind of way, veiling way by, by the end of the 18th century is the rise of Gothic and Romantic literature. Uh, and that literature reveled in the emotional power of, of uh, the, um, the returning dead. So authors like Burns, of course, Hogg, Scott, are all drawn on the supernatural to colour their uh, depictions of Scottish life. So um, the late 18th century is a great time for ghosts. Um, next century, urbanisation, industrialisation, surely that will finish them off. Not at all. Um, Certainly some, some folklore collectors like, like William Robertson in his, his uh, Tales and Legends of Ayrshire uh, sneer at the superstitions of the past, but ghosts still refuse to vanish. And as we'll, we'll see uh, later in the paper, uh, they actually come to a new uh, prominence in the, the late 20th century and beyond. And that's my second theme, very briefly, it's the adaptability of ghosts. Ghost belief is constantly evolving uh, in step with changing cultural and social conditions. So ghosts are not ageless and timeless. Ghosts are shapeshifters. So that's the preamble. Let's meet some of these ghosts then. Who are they? Well, um, they are, uh, there's the odd dark mist in Ayrshire, spooky mists like in uh, Alloway Churchyard. But most Ayrshire ghosts are um, adopt uh, human and animal form. Most are also intact, you know, contrary to the stereotype. Uh, there is one headless ghost uh, that's been identified in the finance department of uh, Ayr County buildings. Uh, and there's also a rolling head without a body uh, witnessed at Dean Castle, but usually they're intact. There are a few child ghosts. Uh, there's one in Pussy Nancy's pub in Mochlin, but these are actually much rarer in Scotland uh, or, or in Britain uh, compared with Catholic Europe, where child ghosts are identified with the spirits of unbaptized children. So adult Ayrshire ghosts are the norm. Um, and here we get one of the first important changes in uh, ghost belief. And that is uh, uh, good news. Uh, ghosts seem to be alive to equal opportunities uh, because the gender balance of hauntings has shifted over time. Uh, in the early modern period, when it was men who recorded most sightings, the great majority of ghosts were male. But uh, Owen Davis in his, uh, uh, another great book, The Haunted, suggests that that began to change uh, in the late 18th century. And again, it's this rise in Gothic literature, which had a big female um, audience. So 
The shift was then cemented further. We go into the 19th century, where we have women having a more active part as uh, mediums, uh, as psychics, and as uh, folklorists. And certainly when we look at Ayrshire, there's no shortage of female ghosts. Uh, the most interesting subgroup are probably the ladies. And uh, we have uh, loads of these ladies. We have white ladies at uh, Kerlock and Loudoun castles, grey ladies at uh, Kilmichael House, Brodick Castle, Blair Castle, and the green ladies, which are simply a particularly Scottish variant, at Sundrum, Killeen, and Maybow. Now, these ladies um, have a long pedigree. One, um, one theory is that they started life as female deities in the pre-Christian period. So if, if you saw a female figure, you couldn't quite understand or explain. Uh, it, it, it was treated as a, as a deity. They were later downgraded into a sort of fairy creature. But then when fairy belief uh, receded, uh, the, they, were, they were reinterpreted in terms of more realistic and identifiable ghosts, such as Lady Jean Hamilton and Lady uh, Flora Hastings. And it is celebrity ghosts, uh, named ghosts, are another feature of Ayrshire hauntings. And um, we have uh, various ones of Mary Queen of Scots, of course, it's everywhere, Mary Queen of Scots and John Knox at Cessna Castle. Uh, we have William Wallace, who uh, pops up uh, opposite my house uh, at Drossen Castle um, and uh, at Ochentiba. But my favourite, I think, has got to be the Honourable Elsie Mackay, a, 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 an amazing creature. She's one of she's a socialite and one of the early uh, female aviators. And her plane disappeared over the Atlantic in 1928. And she apparently was in a, a, an appearance at Glenark Castle. Uh, she appears in a flash of lightning, uh, wearing a flapper outfit. So that, that's some of the celebrities. Uh, turning now to, to animal hauntings, uh, we have quite a few of these in Ayrshire. Uh, there's the ghost of a boar at uh, King and Clue Castle. But I think one of the more, most interesting ones are the, the uh, local legends of black dogs, which um, we get uh, outside Ayr. There we are, outside Ayr and uh, Glen Arp. Now, these black dog legends are common throughout Britain. Um, the, uh, again, though, there has been a subtle shift in ghost belief over time. Uh, the, the black dogs, or shucks, they're called in East Anglia, uh, they were once identified with demonic forces. They were satanic hounds. Um, but by the late 19th century, uh, as belief in the devil, the reality of the devil, begins to recede, uh, so do the legends begin to change. Um, and like the white ladies, these canine apparitions uh, seem to have been downgraded and domesticated over time. So today, uh, canine sightings are, are more likely to be the ghost of someone's pet spaniel uh, than a hound of hell. And uh, again, I'd be really interested to, to hear of any um, pet hauntings that people have witnessed. Two other ghostly categories briefly. Uh, we have a, a rich selection of uh, haunted inanimate objects in Ayrshire. We have a cursed portrait at Penkill Castle, a uh, haunted saddle at Caprington Castle, and of course the haunted billiard table of Cloncaird. There are also quite a number of uh, invisible hauntings. Uh, footsteps at the old Tup Inn in Cumnock, ghostly music, at Dean Castle, appropriately enough, uh, and a bad smell at uh, Dumfries House. Best of all, I think there was the bum pinching ghost at uh, the Castle View pub in Dundonald. The pub has now been renamed, I think, the Auchens, but I, I, whether the ghost is still there, I don't know. So, um, where might you experience an Ayrshire ghost? I'll, I'll obviously, given some hints. Um, Traditionally, ghosts in uh, the medieval 
and early modern periods haunted people. Uh, they came with a purpose. They targeted individuals with a message or a warning. Uh, modern ghosts, though, are much more likely uh, to haunt specific places. So usually these are places, uh, not surprisingly, associated with death, with um, so buildings where generations of people have died. Uh, the one thing that will uh, maybe please skeptics uh, is that building renovations and demo demolitions often prove fatal to hauntings. So I mentioned this, the bad smell at Dumfries House. So since Dumfries House has been um, taken over by um, uh, uh, King Charles, I should say, um, and renovated, the smell has apparently disappeared. But um, there remain hot spots and uh, hospitals um, are, are, are one. Uh, the old Ravens Park site in Irvine uh, is one that has been reckoned to be particularly haunted. It's uh, uh, supposed to have at least four ghosts, including one called Peekaboo Pete. But of course, the other uh, building for hauntings uh, are, are castles. Castles are ghost magnets. Uh, Killeen has seven ghosts. Uh, Adrossen has two. Uh, Denure has one, but it's the ghost of a roasted abbot, uh, which I think gets extra points. But again, we see ghosts um, becoming more uh, democratic over time. And they are now as, as likely to manifest themselves in uh, ordinary family homes. Uh, one notable haunting uh, was in Cumnock, um, uh, a, a Cumnock council house uh, in the, the 1970s that was um, supposedly haunted by uh, the ghost of a, a police officer who'd committed suicide in the house. Um, another one, in 2008, more recently, was a, a cottage, just a family, a family home in Largs. Uh, shops, pubs, hotels are also common haunting sites in Ayrshire. Uh, the psychic shop in Kilmarnock reported a presence in uh, 2014, and you would, you would hope so. Uh, Coburnie once had a haunted video shop, and Beath had a haunted Chinese restaurant. Uh, Ayrshire ghosts are also active in uh, traditional haunting sites like churchyards, uh, including Alloway, and in the uh, gibbet sites. And there's a, a quite a, a chilling uh, recent ghost story told to me about an encounter uh, near the old Moot Hill at uh, Giffordland outside Rye, which was one of these uh, gibbet sites. Some of the most enduring hauntings um, have been recorded at, at liminal sites. Liminal sites being sites at the boundaries between two worlds or states, like crossroads, rivers, pools, bridges. And um, here's one such site, Mary's Pool in Bead. And Mary's Pool uh, was uh, local folklore it has it as a, uh, a murder site in the Victorian period or, um, or previously, um, but certainly it was linked to another uh, murder in Beath in the 1960s. So it's, it's a, a place with um, a, what is it, a, a haunted local reputation. Finally, since uh, Ayrshire ghosts have been so uh, adaptable to changing times, it's no surprise that uh, they resp actually responded well to industrialization, far from being, as I said, driven out by it. And so mines, factories, railways, with a grim uh, toll of industrial accidents, um, they have, these have all been uh, fertile fields for uh, ghost sightings. Um, the, there are a number of uh, certainly uh, railway ghosts uh, and mining ghosts 
uh, again of a long history. Uh, there was one, uh, a, a warning spirit at, at the old uh, Noshinnok colliery. Uh, and these uh, mining ghosts, again, can, you can trace back to earlier theory belief. So tell me now to, to the third question and the, the most difficult one, I think. Um, why do they want, or, or to put it another way, why do some ghost stories have such a long shelf life? After all, the, the traditional ghost that I mentioned earlier, who came and appeared to an individual with a message or a warning, um, delivered that message and then left. That was it. But from the 18th century onwards, uh, modern ghosts, as it's been suggested, seem to linger longer uh, and they now haunt specific sites rather than individuals uh, and often they are commemorating sad personal events. For those that, that do make the cut, um, some ghost stories are powerful and enduring enough uh, to become freestanding folklore. And there are many examples of this, like the, the deal of a Drossen, uh, who's uh, said to uh, haunt Castle Hill and a Drossen Castle. But more commonly, the lifespan of uh, a ghost story uh, depends on the strength of oral tradition and um, local memory, and uh, shared memory in local communities. And for that to work, for, for, a, for a ghost to stick, um, the ghost needs ideally to be located in time and identified with a person in the past to make sense of it. Um, so legends, of course, can give a haunting a, a backstory, but it's much more effective if the haunting is linked to... Um, uh, a, a real event, and, and often it is it's a, a recent a suicide or a murder or, or some uh, dimly remembered local tragedy. Sometimes the location of the haunting itself provides the evidence, uh, like a castle uh, or a ghost's distinctive clothing. And where evidence is scanty, Imagination often does the rest, which might explain the multiple sightings of Mary Queen of Scots uh, and William Wallace. But there's change here too in how these sightings are interpreted. Previous generations were in no doubt that ghosts were the spirits of the dead, uh, wandering souls. In our more secularised age though, uh, ghosts are more likely to be explained in quasi-scientific terms as residual energy or as, as ultra-low sound waves, another theory. And it's no surprise that another factor that has shaped modern ghost sightings is technology. So there's a whole range of equipment developed uh, by paranormal investigators. Uh, like ghost boxes and EVP spike meters. But sometimes it's uh, unintended photograph, uh, photographic images that provide some of the most um, popular evidence of um, local hauntings. I'll show you one of these. Ah, and this is one, this is a ghostly image of a face in the window. You'll get your nose up to the screen there. Um, that is in large burial ground. Uh, it's near, near Burns Garden, Douglas Park. And that was uh, captured um, by uh, just a, a, a casual visitor who later uh, believed he had identified this ghostly face. So it gained quite a lot of press coverage in uh, 2016. But I think my favourite recent uh, one uh, is this my recent, the recent issue of ghost story is uh, of a family 
uh, in Drongen, who believed that the spirit of their recently deceased grandmother was captured uh, on a baby monitor. And that's in, um, in just in uh, 2021. So I think that the, 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 the blobs of light uh, they, they are interpreting as a, a paranormal um, event. Um, but these examples, I think, show another shift in the history of hauntings. Uh, now, our ancestors would have done anything to avoid ghosts, but we seem to seek them out. And indeed, Owen Davis suggests that a whole uh, new category in uh, uh, a whole new category of ghost uh, and what he calls the tourist ghost so tourism is now an important factor in shaping how and where ghosts are seen uh, there's nothing new of course about ghost hunting um, uh, the, the really got into its stride in the uh, later 19th century but what modern tourism has done is repackage that. Uh, and it's created a new linkage between the visitor, the place, and the ghost. So the visitor is the customer. Uh, the place is the brand identity, if you like. And uh, the ghost is the commodity, a desirable commodity, uh, rather than a pest. Now, it doesn't mean that hauntings are deliberately manufactured, though some may be, um, but there is a whole cottage industry now of haunted pub guides, hotel, uh, haunted hotels, uh, ghost walks, and, with, and towns competing to claim the accolade of most haunted. Now, this is largely a, a recent, a late 20th century development. But Ayrshire, of course, was well ahead of the game when it came to the commercial exploitation of the supernatural. And we just think of, again, of Alloway Kirk as an early tourist site. And ghosts are still good for business. Uh, and the National Trust were uh, well aware of this. Um, turn it back one. Uh, yeah, we're well aware of this um, when the invited the most haunted team uh, to Killeen Castle way back in, 20, uh, sorry, in um, 2002. And that was in the very first uh, series of that programme, Killeen was featured. Of course, we also have here with Kelburn Castle. Uh, ironically, Kelburn is one of the few Ayrshire castles that does not have a, a, a ghost, does not have a resident ghost. But instead, what it does is create a whole haunted forest uh, at Halloween, uh, which is marketed as an immersive horror experience. So, uh, just to, to to wind up the to wind up now, uh, the, the last question I posed was: Do ghosts have a future? Absolutely. Um, Ayrshire's ghost story is not one of decline. Uh, it, and like the brownies and the bogles, uh, Ayrshire ghosts uh, continue to flourish. And that's true, actually, across Britain. Um, there has been a resurgence of ghost belief uh, from the late 20th century onwards. Or it may just be that uh, TV and cinema and the tourist industry have all made people more relaxed uh, about admitting their belief in ghosts. A YouGov survey in 2017 uh, revealed that a third of, of British people believed in ghosts. Um, I think it was only 2% believed in vampires, which is a bit worrying, werewolves even less, but a third believed in ghosts and other paranormal activity. Other surveys have suggested the figure could be as high as 52%. So why is this? Why, why is ghost belief still rooted? Um, some psychologists say that believers in ghosts 
sheer distinctive cognitive styles. Uh, they're more intuitive and reflective thinkers. Others argue that it's local environmental factors uh, like light levels and uh, changes in magnetic fields that help explain paranormal activity. But maybe it's more basic than that. In a society where conventional religious belief seems to be ebbing, um, there's a great uneasiness, I think, over whether the end is really the end. Uh, so whether people view ghosts as residual energy or as uh, spirits of the dead, ghosts still seem to promise to us that there is more to come. And that is the end for me, but uh, I'll just leave that one for a wee minute. And I really would be very uh, happy to uh, hear um, uh, anybody's uh, ghost story if they want to contact me. And um, I'm, I'm sure Abigail will make my uh, email address um, available to you. So uh, thank you very much for listening and I hope I haven't scared you too much. I think this is now sorted and I can give you some views on burns. Um, I'm speaking to you from Edinburgh, and here is a picture of Edinburgh, where in 1792 um, was Alexander Cunningham, a friend of Robert Burns, and Burns wrote to him, here is to your good health, for you must know I have set a nipperkin of toddy by me, just by way of spell to keep away the meekle horned deal or any of his subaltern imps who may be on their nightly rounds. Later in that letter, Burns said that he needed help. I feel, I feel the presence of supernatural assistance. The supernatural assistance was, in fact, in a glass. Burns wrote on several occasions about the supernatural. He always writes about it, with one possible exception, he always writes about it in a humorous, playful way. And what I want to do today is to look at some issues to do with this, Returning at the end to Tam O'Shanter, this is Tam O'Shanter as seen by an artist who actually has the same name as me, namely John Burnett. Uh, this is a pre-Victorian, a pre-sanitizing of, um, of the story with Tam and Souter Johnny suitably um, affected by alcohol. This playful spirit, though, is with, and now this is refusing to go into the, ah, here we are. This playful spirit in Burns is recognised by this artist. This is Charles Doyle, the father of Arthur Conan Doyle. Here we have the devil with the exciseman, who's looking very surprised, not least because he's about to be toasted using the toasting fork in the devil's right hand, which is, in fact, the end of his tail. Now, this is, this is great fun. This is very playful. This is what Burns is doing with the supernatural, not the supernatural. And here is a verse from the address to the deal, where he imagines being out at night when we an eldritch stoor quack quack among the springs away you squattered like a drake on whistling wings he, he's being quite honest the devil is not real the devil is his imagining when because he thinks because he's frightened by a duck or to take another poem um the when he sent a message to his friend Captain Groves through Adam de Cardinal. He said, 
he was going to pay him with the coins of Satan's coronation. Well, these are real coronation coins, George III in 1761. And um, the idea is that these coronation medals, I should say rather, um, these are given to people who are loyal. So he's telling his friend that he thinks he's loyal to the devil, which is, I suggest, not serious. Kelpies, well, of course, this is what a Kelpie really looks like, brackets not, in Falkirk. This is Burns's Kelpie, as in the address to the deal. Kelpie on the left, luring two drunks off to their demise. Kelpies are seriously bad news. And yet Burns says, and this is still the same letter to Alexander Cunningham. That he might have assistance from a Kelpie, as thou viewest the perils and miseries of man on the foundering horse or in the tumbling boat being drowned. Now, the point I want to draw your attention to there is the grammar, as thou viewest. In other words, this is, in a mild way, a parody of the Bible. The However, okay, that's the end of the introduction. Um, at the beginning of the 18th century, it was still usual for people to think that they had encountered the devil physically, that he did walk the roads of Scotland, Ayrshire. And in particular, the devil was known to try to disrupt family prayers. After yont the dyke, she's heard your bummin' wi' eerie drone, or rustling through the boor trees comin' wi' heavy groan. In other words, the, the sounds made by trees in the wind were taken to be the devil himself trying to disrupt people. Or, to put it in verse, as a minister in Kirkubri did, they, the people frequently saw the devil who made wicked, wicked attacks upon them when they were engaged in their religious exercises. To give another example, there was the case, quite a well-known case in 1682, where someone achieved something by interacting with the devil in Irvine. A servant was accused of theft, of, of stealing some silver. She went through some complex rituals and got the devil to tell her where the the silver was, and she was able to say to her employers, look there and you'll find it, and I'm not guilty. And they said, oh yes, that's fine. We're now accusing you of witchcraft. Where that one ended is not at all clear. The third one I want to mention is the case of Christian Shaw of Bargaran. This is almost the best known of Scottish witch cases. The point about that is that witch belief was very much alive in 1696-97 when this case was carried through and six people were executed. Uh, Bargaran is on the south side of the Clyde, round, um, well, it's in er Erskine Parish. Um, but over the following century, there was a large decline in belief in the supernatural. There's one wonderful account of the parish of Mousewald, or Muzold, I imagine, where it was believed that a stone circle, standing stones in a circle, had been the stone remains of shearers in harvest who had indulged in the, the practice um, very much disliked by farmers of racing one another to try and finish the harvest first. It meant that they, 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 they did the, um, the harvest badly. They were turned into stones, but they weren't just disregarded when ideas began to change. 
They were blasted with gunpowder used to build houses. So the, it, it, this is the supernatural or, or the demise of su the supernatural becoming involved with the whole issue of change in the countryside, not least because the land that it, they were on had been a common and when it was enclosed, these stones were sorted. A minister from Wigtown wrote in the 1790s, the belief in witches, in fairies or other ideal beings, though not entirely discarded, is gradually dying out. Or, this is Robert Heron, the first biographer of Burns, describes the supernatural in southwest Scotland and says it's becoming every year less numerous, less frequent. Now, this is all quite clear, although perhaps not quite complete. One of the ways it is, that it's incomplete is that it's not explaining why this change is taking place. But it, take, but it was there and it was applied to the devil. In the Holy Fair, Burns says, should Horne, as in ancient days, my sons are God, present him. In other words, if the devil, as he used to do, were to, were to appear, but in other words, he's not appearing anymore. The devil has gone from the streets and fields of Ayrshire. But a part of this is that you need the devil to make a witch. And if the devil isn't active, if the devil is receding, then where are the witches? Well, the witches are in decline too. Rather than go to Burns for evidence, two of his friends I'll mention, Ebenezer Picken, describes two old men thinking about the past and the present and how the world has changed. And one of them asks the other to repeat sick, witty, nice, old foreign stories or deals of witches, Whigs and Tories. He wants to hear the old fashioned stories about witches. That's Pickin. As for Siller, he actually recounts a meeting between the devil and some of his witches where the devil does a bit of leadership and flattering of his witches. A Kenya used hand, there's scarce your match in all the land. And then the witch replies, you're all rang. We have been at the trade hour lang. They kicked there's a letter missing in the um, in the text. They kicked Krutrich arse, and then they flung her in a ditch. Yon learned folk are grown grown our strong for any witch. The learned folk are the ministers. And what is happening is that by the second half of the century, well, by 1780, shall we say, 1770. Um, the whole idea of the witch is threatening. It's still a negative way of looking at someone, but the danger and the threat to Christian religion has more or less disappeared. The fair at Haddington was very ill attended, said the Caledonian Mercury, owing to a ridiculous story propagated by an old woman who pretended to be a prophetess, that there would be another large flood which would sweep away the whole town. There had been one flood already, but this is a ridiculous story. She's pretending to be a prophetess. If she'd done that a hundred years earlier, she would have been identified as a witch. Now she's just an eccentric nuisance. There's a case in Ochotry in 1788 where a woman who is labelled as a milk witch, in other words, a witch whose power is to um, stop cattle giving milk, is accused of something far larger. 
which is that she has stopped a woman from giving birth and that the pregnant woman is remaining pregnant because of the witch's action. And this comes up in front of the Kirk session, who quite sensibly say, uh, why don't you just make friends with one another? Um, this doesn't go anywhere until apparently it gets to the local court, the um, Justice of the Peace Court, who tell them to make friends with one another. They do, and the woman immediately goes into labour and gives birth to two children, one live and one dead. Now, there's obviously something wrong there. The last sentence in the newspaper report, however, is this extraordinary phenomenon has attracted the attention of the public and affords much curious speculation. In other words, it's not clear to people then what's going on, but it's nothing particularly alarming. We're doing okay. So, um, this shows that my earlier problems with um, computers. This was intended to be in the middle of the screen. It was intended to be in larger type and it wasn't supposed to be reversed out. Apart from that, um, I hope it's reasonably clear. This is the important distinction between different parts of the church, between the Orthodox Calvinists and the new people, the moderates. The crucial thing for the present is that the Orthodox were capable of behaving, of believing in superstition. It's not dead straightforward. And, but moderates were definitely against it. Robert Burns was a moderate. We can assume that his friends Siller and Picken were moderates. And they're the people who are writing the books. Um, to give one example out of Burns, this is from his poem, it's the first of two quotations from his poem, Halloween. One of the young women has tried a ritual to find out who she's going to marry and it goes wrong and she's terrified by a rat running up the wall. But the crucial point here is that she prayed with zeal and fervor, because if she does, does that, she's saying that she is an Orthodox Calvinist. She's an old fashioned believer, probably in witches. And um, she has an emotional approach to religion as compared with Jamie Fleck, who swore by his conscience that he could sow hemp, hemp seed. This is another, the beginning of another ritual, for it was all but nonsense. In other words, what's nonsense is that the devil is going to enable this discovery of who they're all, they are all going to marry. And the giveaway word is conscience, because if you think you've got a conscience, then you're a new licht, you're a moderate, and you don't believe any of this stuff. So, well, you can guess what that is, but there's something to say before I get there. We've been talking about whether witches were remembered, were, were, were recognized, and the answer, of course, is yes, sort of, but they're not very important. There is also the issue of what Mickey was talking about a few minutes ago, the witch trials, because they were definitely remembered. And the one which is remembered most particularly in the west of Scotland is the Bargarren case, Christian Shaw. And the narrative of that case is reprinted at Paisley in 1775. It's in, it's a part, well, I mean, religion and the witch trials were part of popular culture. Even if it was a very long time since they were held, they were still there. And the then minister of Erskine in the 1790s addresses this and he says, 
an account has recently been published of this witch case, every paragraph of which is affirmed to have been subscribed by witnesses, among whom we find the names of almost all the noblemen and gentlemen and many ministers of the neighborhood. It may function, it, it may furnish ample matter of speculation to those whose object is to trace the progress and variations of manners and opinion among men. In other words, what he's saying is that we now have, we in the 1790s, now have a different view, and that it implies that people like him, the moderates, have changed views. But the important thing is that the witch trials are being held at a distance and they're being recognised, because underneath all of this, there are still some people who believed in witches. Right, Tamas Shanter. Tamas Shanter, in the light of what I've been saying, is set in a complete orthodox Calvinist world. Tam and his wife Kate both believe in all sorts of supernatural beings. He's terrified as he goes through the countryside by all the awful things that have happened. He believes they, they believe in the in the supernatural in completely, and this is with a small O for orthodox, orthodox ways. There's the devil, there are the witches, there is a witch's Sabbath. What I want to draw attention to though is that there's these lines in the description of the young, the newly fledged witch, Nanny, lang, who is lang kenned after, long lang after kenned on Carrick shore, for money a beast did she shot and perished money a bonny boat. Now, two things. Firstly, this is set in the past, because it's as though Burns is saying that she, the young witch, has finished her career, because that's what these lines imply. So she said, so all of this is a long way in the past, but also he says that she killed animals and caused storms which sank boats. But these are conventional things. This is what, you know, witches did. This is what the gossip was about. What isn't different from that is the lines a little bit earlier where Burns is describing what's on the Haley table, the exhibition of the methods and progress of witchcraft. And towards the end of that, he speaks these lines. In particular, a knife a father's throat had mangled, whom his ain son a life bereft, the grey hairs yet stuck to the heft. To the heft. Um, what we have there is real, straightforward, brutal evil. And it's not modified by witches who have largely disappeared. It's not modified by the supernatural. It is straight, straightforward badness. And I think this is the end point that comes in out in interpreting Tamas Shanter in the light of what I've been saying today, that Burns is writing a comic poem, but there are some very serious patches in it, and this is one of them. So that's what I've got to say. One final image, with thanks particularly to 
Linda and Bruce at the Dick Institute who gave me access to this material. This is the frontispiece of the address to the deal. And there on the left from a high point is the poet addressing. And it's not Burns in this case because he's got a beard and he's waving a hand. And I think we have the devil himself down here, almost directly underneath the poet, um, with various of his victims being barbecued around him. There are a lot of Burns illustrations in editions of his works, but this is absolutely at the top end of the quality. The artist is Thomas Landseer, who was the brush brother of Edwin Landseer. Uh, Thomas Landseer had a, a quiet but impressive career. He was profoundly deaf and he made a lot of his career as an artist engraving his more successful brothers or his more publicly successful brothers' pictures. So there is our address to the deal. Thank you all for listening. So just by way of sort of setting this up, um, I am a historian of religion and the supernatural in early modern Scotland. My first book was on belief in the devil. Um, I've written on sermons, the Reformation, and now I am working on a project on 17th century air during the tenure of minister William Adair, who many of you will know was minister there um, in the 17th century uh, for about 44 years, a really remarkable time period. And I've been really fascinated in the religious ideas and identities at play during his time as minister. Um, and he presided over a number of really interesting witch hunts that I will talk about today. So I will say uh, for anyone hoping that this was a talk about the witches of Ayrshire, um, I can give you some stories about witches from, from neighboring parishes uh, in the period, but I really will be for focusing on the parish of Ayr for today. But I thought what I would do initially is to set the scene, um, to give you a sense of what witch hunting looked like, not just in Scotland, but as part of a broader European story. Um, one of the points that I always make to my students when teaching about Scottish history is Scotland has always been, as of course all of you will know, deeply connected with a broader European story, European trends, beliefs, and ideas. There were always unique and important Scottish variants, but we ought to understand Scotland, and I think Britain more broadly, as part of this broader early modern moment. Now, when I say early modern, of course, I mean the 16th and 17th century, and this was the heyday of witch hunting. Um, if you hear anybody say that the witch hunts happened in the medieval era, they are actually quite wrong about that. Um, the witch hunts really begin in earnest at the end, of, very end of the, the uh, 1400s and take off over the course of the 16th and 17th century, the peak of witch hunting being between the mid 16 or mid 16th century and mid 17th century. So it's a really widespread phenomenon. And by that, I mean that there are witch hunts from Russia all the way across the pond to my side of the Atlantic in Salem. And the numbers are really quite surprising to people if they haven't studied the witch hunts. Uh, there are about 100,000 individuals that historians um, think were accused, formally accused of witchcraft. And by that, I mean that that actually were brought to court um, at some level or another. Now, we don't have perfect records. Historians are relying on extant records. So what has survived the ravages and the tests of time? So their numbers are never exact. But we think about 100,000 people accused. Um, and of these, if we're looking at Europe as a whole, about 50% 50, uh, 50 or 50,000 of them executed for this supposed crime of witchcraft. Um, there are tremendous amounts of regional variation. And of course, today I'll be focusing on Scottish witch hunting and the witch hunts in air more specifically. But do know again that this is part of a, a broader phenomenon. And I'm happy to answer any questions about why it happened when it did. The Scottish variety of of witch hunting, Scotland is known by historians as an especially intense place of witch hunting. And that's partially because in Scotland, the theological emphasis 
on, okay, I see the closed caption has come on. I will slow down in case I'm talking too quickly um, in my American accent. So I, I'm, I'm aware that I, that I have a tendency to do that. So in Scotland, this theological emphasis on the devil um, combined with a real social push for purity and a certain level of political interest in witch hunting from the Scottish state to make Scotland a hotbed of witch hunting akin in some ways to the large hunts in the Holy Roman Empire or in Salem, Massachusetts. And to put this in perspective, to give you a sense of just how intense Scottish witch hunting was, at least comparatively, is a Scottish woman was about 12 times more likely to be accused of witchcraft than her English counterpart south of the border, despite the fact that population disparities meant that England was quite a lot larger. And in Scotland, we had about, historians think, um, about 2,500 people who were executed in the usual Scottish way, first by strangulation and then by burning. Scottish witches were not burned alive. Now, the reason I say that this is an organized effort is at its core, the practice of witch hunting was something that in th authorities were deeply engaged in. Secular authorities, political authorities, local, state, religious, all of these people coalesced together in their efforts in the 16th and 17th centuries to get rid of what they thought was a conspiracy of witches poised to overthrow Christendom. The reason witch hunting was a deadly business is because people in the period, particularly people in positions of power, believed that witches themselves were deadly, right? Um, now, of course, there's no actual evidence of the sort of demonically inspired witchcraft crime that authorities thought that they were dealing with. That is to say, we don't have any evidence that individuals were meeting the devil in a dark night on a hill and copulating with him and dancing and eating babies and all the things that actually go into this idea of the early modern witches' Sabbath. And in fact, I would say that most individuals who were accused of witchcraft were not even dabbling in magic, but they got caught up in what really was a demonic fantasy, a sort of early modern conspiracy theory that everyone from the king down to the lowliest person got involved in in some way or another, though they may have had somewhat different ideas of what constituted witchcraft. And I think this is a sort of important point. When I say this is an imagined crime, it absolutely was. I mean, we don't, historians, um, and this is to Elaine's point earlier, they deal in empirical evidence, right? Um, historians are, are sort of not working in the realm of sort of the supernatural. So we, we can only deal with what we know, but it really does, it, I mean, all evidence suggests, I certainly think this is an imagined crime, which is in some ways what makes it such a tragedy. That said, authorities believed it was very real. And ordinary people too were tremendously fearful of the power of witchcraft to harm their crops, to render their husband impotent, whatever it might have been. We have to take that seriously. When people were hunting witches, they were hunting witches because they believed them to be witches. This was not a mere tool of social control as it sometimes gets caricatured. And that is actually quite, quite crucial. Now, one of the things that historians have been really interested in is a critical fact that 85% of those accused of witchcraft in Scotland were women. Um, the numbers are about 80% if you're looking at Europe as a whole, but 85% uh, were women. And I think gender is really important in understanding the hunt because there were certain sorts of women that were far more likely to be named by either men or other women as witches than their male counterparts. Um, it's not because they were necessarily poor or widowed as the stereotype often suggests, but often it's because certain women had reputations that could lead them vulnerable to witchcraft accusations. The reputation as someone who was promiscuous, the reputation as someone who had a loose and dangerous tongue, the reputation as someone who was unruly and a problem to the Kirk. And some of the stories I will tell you about today really give us a window into what sorts of women could be vulnerable to witchcraft accusations. But I do want to stress that they were hunted or accused of witchcraft because they were believed to be witches. This was not a war on women as such. But the question is, again, 
why did people, when they imagined the witch, think of a woman? And that has to do with some very old and intense ideas in Christianity about female demonic vulnerability to Satan that dates all the way back to interpretations of Genesis 3, um, which I'm, I'm very happy to talk about. But we should get into air after I've laid out that introduction. So I'm going to give you really a sort of focused look at some witch hunts in the middle of 17th century air. Um, as I say, my research has center, centered on this guy. So many of y'all will have already seen this before if you've visited the Old Kirk of Air anytime recently or anytime at all. This is, of course, Minister William Adair. He was known at the time as a man of great prayer capabilities. So you see him, of course, with his hands bowed there. Um, this was in this uh, statue of him, this honoring him, was built uh, a couple of years after his death in 1682. So he served the parish in the dates that you see up here on the screen, 1638 to 1682. And these were some of Scotland's most dramatic years. 1638, many of you will know, um, was the date of the signing of the National Covenant. Um, now, the National Covenant, and I, I realize I'm used to talking to American audiences about this who are like, what is that thing? Um, everyone who grew up in the southwestern part of Scotland probably knows more than they ever wanted to about the Covenanters. Um, but, but regardless, uh, this document, the National Covenant, of course, signed as a statement of resistance against what were perceived as popish incursions of uh, Charles I and his archbishop, and in defense of the true religion. And the witch hunts have to be understood within the context of covenanting, within the context of the covenanters pushing for a great moral reform of society and the eradication of sin. Um, just as witch hunts outside of this period in Scotland are also really part of a Reformation story where the Protestant church was really seeking a certain level of purity. For men like William Adair and his covenanting bedfellows, they felt that they had to devote their lives, their limbs at times, their entire energies to purifying society in a whole range of ways in order to uphold their promise to God and to community in the covenant. And part of that led to seeing witchcraft as one of the grievous sins of the community that must be eradicated. Um, there's been some really good work done actually on covenanting witch hunting by Paula Hughes and John Young, if you're curious about the historians, who've thought about what it meant, particularly during the covenanting era, for witches to be hunted. And we see some really interesting shifts in the 1640s and 50s of accused witches confessing not to making a pact with the devil, but explicitly to making a covenant with him in a reversal, uh, a sort of heretical reversal of the promise in the covenants. Now, Eyre had, prior to the period of the Covenanters, which is my area of interest, had a long history of witch hunting. Um, and some of these stories, I should add, are sort of harrowing to read. Um, and we have bits of evidence that give us a sense of precisely how Eyre was conducting its witch hunt. Um, this, for example, you see a little excerpt from this, is, is from a, a, an account book from Eyre in 1595 that notes that money was spent on the coals, the cords, the tar, tar barrels, and other great material uh, that burnt Marian grief. Um, there's almost a strange economic aspect to witch hunting that is both very dehumanizing to the accused, but also gives us a sense of how witch hunting was a project of both localities and the broader state. So we have historian snippets of this um, in the sort of Arab borough records, for example. I think um, some of you will know the case of Janet Smelly, which is a long story um, that takes place over the case, the course of a couple of decades in air. And I'll, I'll say just a bit about this. It's one of the more brutal cases that began before the tenure of Minister William Adair, but was very much ended at the time of, of his, his ministry. Um, in 1613, Janet Smelly had appeared before the Kirk session at air accused of, quote, filthy, slanderous speeches towards her neighbors. A lot of these cases of witchcraft involve stories of women speaking in ways that were deemed deviant or unacceptable. In punishment for saying these filthy speeches, she was hauled before the town's fish cross, 
Um, of course, the stone marker at the center of Ayers Bushling Fish Market at the time, where a small spiked instrument was placed into her mouth. Um, she had apparently been a long time blasphemer and constant thorn in the side of the Kirk. A 1621 case in the session records tells how Smelly had repeatedly been imprisoned for, quote, numerous misbehaviors to sundry persons and had been convicted for also intending to poison herself. Um, so she, clearly she was a woman who was deeply troubled um, and really struggling. And of course, her own personal troubles were only magnified by the punishments that she had experienced. And in 1621, she was banished from the town. Um, she came back. Um, she made amends enough to be resettled in the town in 1630. Um, but again, in that period, she appeared before the, the local magistrates accused of great crimes. And this time, she was accused in 1630 of the open profession and practices of witchcraft and sorcery. That's what the records tell us. Um, which this accusation is entirely unsurprising for a woman with Smelly's reputation. Right, um, reputation is really key in understanding why some people were accused and others were not. And I'll say more about that in the context of air later on. Um, for this, this sort of crime of witchcraft, interestingly, she was not executed. Um, but instead in this moment, she was dragged and flogged through the town. She was burned on the cheek for her crime, which was actually a really unusual punishment for witchcraft. Um, and she was banished and told, do not return except only under pain of death. Um, so she left. However, she came back. Um, there is another woman who appears in our story, uh, also by the name of Janet Smelly. It was probably the same person in May of 1650. And we have records of her in 1650 being in jail yet again um, and finding no dignity in death because she showed up again at a really dangerous moment. In 1650, Air was in the midst of one of its most intense periods of witch hunting. And Minister William Adair, who had on his hands this rash of witchcraft cases, um, 1650s was also a period of tremendous discord and upheaval in the upper echelon of the General Assembly and, and sort of authorities within the Scottish Kirk, um, and also a moment in which Cromwell's forces were on the ascendant, and there was quite a lot of worry about that. And Adair um, ordered that Smelly's corpse be carried on a sled to the gallows and burnt in ashes, a sort of belated execution for her devilish crime um, meant to uh, deny her an ordinary Christian burial and rid the body, uh, the world of her body. And the story of Janet Smelly really brings us, I think, to this sort of moment that I'll say a bit more about this period of 1650 to 1651, a period of witchcraft abounding, according to authorities. Um, and I think, again, I'm really interested in having everyone understand that witchcraft has to be grappled with in its specific context, right? Witchcraft was not a crime on the margins. Witchcraft was a crime that was the product of a society deeply invested in the eradication of sin um, because of a whole host of, of religious reasons largely connected to the Reformation and the Covenanting Project. Um, I was really struck by what Elaine said about you know, ghosts in some ways are a lens to understanding much broader mentalities from the period. And I think witches occupy much the same position. Um, this, this excerpt that you see here on the screen is an excerpt from the Presbytery records of Air. So Air Presbytery was sort of overseeing a range of local parishes. Um, and in this, this is sort of thing that historians deal with. This is a lovely hand, by the way. I, I'm always appreciative of appreciative when, when we have nice handwriting in, in the records. Um, but in this moment, this is in the spring of 1650, members of the Air Presbytery took into, quote, serious consideration with great grief of heart, that horrible and exorable sin of witchcraft at the time so much abounding in the land. So at the Presbytery, all of these ministers are meeting and saying, this is a major problem and we have to grapple with it. And again, witchcraft was a tragedy. It was a sort of abhorrent thing that happened, but it was also a product of that great grief of heart, that genuine sense that something was awry. 
And every minister within the Air Presbytery region was told that they should be faithful and careful in searching out witches in their own parishes. So you can imagine the heightened anxiety here when your local minister is giving everyone an extra close look um, to see who might be practicing witchcraft among them. Um, a week later, to give you a sense of the regional variety here, the Presbytery at Irving, Irvine um, also noted that it had been, quote, finding that the sin of witchcraft was growing daily and lamenting that, quote, Mikkel of the hidden works of darkness had been discovered in its own parishes. And it, both of these presbyteries in the 1650, early 1650, are requesting commissions from central authorities in Edinburgh to try these supposed evildoers. These things started locally, but they became centralized. Um, eventually, Eyre did get permission to pursue its witches, um, and they began to gather these confessions from accused witches in May of 1650. Um, we actually have a letter from this spring from Minister William Adair written to um, the man who was at the time the moderator of the General Assembly, one of the most important um, sort of positions in Scotland, really. And in this letter, William Adair talked about a, you know, what's going on with the war, fighting against Cromwell's forces. Of course, by this point, um, we're in this moment known as the Second English Civil War. The Scots had joined actually with the forces of Charles I against Cromwell. And the minister in this letter expressed deep fear that the late malignancies and opposition of some to the work of God in this place has flowed from a deeper root than the common communal corruption of nature. Satan, he was implying, was clearly at work. All men were fallen according to these Calvinist types, but some were fallen worse than others. And in the summer of 1650, this number of the accused grows. Um, and the Kirk session agreed to appoint every day an elder and a deacon to oversee any accused witches who had come into the prison at air who were waiting in the toll booth. And these elders and deacons stayed up long nights with these witches, trying to get them to do further confession um, and to make sure they were not spreading their demonic ideas to others. Um, so you can imagine, right, this moment of these elders taking these day shifts in the prison, the toll booth of air, with these accused poor women who were undoubtedly fearful of their fates. And we ought to understand this desire for confession, I think, as um, really uh, the a couple of things. Authorities wanted to understand what these witches were reportedly doing, right? They wanted to get to grips with who their enemies were, what the devil was doing. They also wanted to have confession and indeed sincere confession so that they as a community could potentially stave off the wrath of God. Now, we don't know what happened to a lot of the witches accused in the summer of 1650. We know that a number of them were in prison, but we don't have records of what happened, how they met their fates. But we do know the fates of the four women that I have on the screen here, um, who were accused the following year in the early fall of 1651 in air. Janet Sawyer, Sloan, Crawford, and Elizabeth Cunningham. I do not know why all 17th century women are called Janet. Um, it is low-key the most common name um, in, in the records uh, for, for women of this period. There's also quite a lot of Marians um, and Margarets in, in air, air at the time, and maybe still are, I actually don't know, but I'm always sort of, I'm always saying, which Janet am I talking about here? So we, we've seen a number of, um, maybe it's just not a good idea to name your children Janet uh, during the time period because so many of them are being accused of, of witchcraft. But anyhow, in the early fall of 1651, we find these four women sitting in the toll booth at Ayr. They had been accused, they had been promptly arrested. And what's sort of interesting is initially the provost of the town, a guy at the time called Hugh Kennedy, um, and a number of his sort of former Baileys, people who had been officers of the court, tried actually to have these four women exonerated. Said basically, let's not try them. I don't think we should move forward. But Adair and others pushed on and a commission was granted for their trial. 
but remarkably, they aren't tried. And in fact, they aren't actually tried for another seven years. Why? Because of a very major event um, that you can see the ruins of in the fair city of air today, of course, and that is the Cromwellian occupation. By the end of 1651 and the beginning of 1652, the city is overrun with English soldiers who, I should add, are making a lot of trouble for local authorities because they are constantly sleeping with local women. Um, that's a story for another time. But if you want to know about fornication cases in the 1650s, I can tell you many stories. But these cases were temporarily delayed because of this, partially because also English authorities were really reticent to try witches. They sort of, at the time, they sort of viewed this as a weird Scottish phenomenon, despite the fact that they'd been trying a lot of witches themselves the previous decade in England. But we will, we will set that aside so I do not get too bogged down. So during the Cromwellian occupation, for seven years, these women lived their lives surely hoping for reprieve, surely hoping their former accusations would be forgotten and they would not potentially face um, the, the strangulation and the stake, but this was not to be. Um, they found themselves again as the Cromwellian occupation was winding down in 1658 in the toll booth of air, awaiting trial for devilish crimes they had purportedly committed just before Cromwell's men had invaded their town. Now, Janet Sawyer is the first of these women to be tried. Um, the document that you're seeing on the right here, um, I'm kind of a document nerd, I'm a historian, um, as y'all probably know, um, as I've mentioned, but I, this is actually from the Justiciary's court records. It's a copy of them. Um, usually, again, these cases began at the local level with an accusation coming to the Kirk session or even more directly to the Presbytery. The Presbytery would then petition local authorities for the rights to move forward with trials of these individuals, sometimes at more localized circuit courts, sometimes um, in Edinburgh themselves. And this is uh, the sort of list of actually 17 different accusations that uh, Sawyer faces. Um, these are just the first two, but you see her name there up on, on the right, or uh, yeah, up on the right of your screen. Now, I think what's interesting about these 17 charges, and I promise I'm going to Oh, well, I'm not going to speed up in my talking, but I will not stay too down in, in the weeds here. I'll stay focused. Um, she, many of the charges against her centered on old communal quarrels, um, you know, the, the grievances that she had long shared with her neighbors. Um, she was, for example, accused of speaking to a neighbor's horse and putting her arms around that horse's neck. And then the horse soon died and the neighbor himself uh, faced a lot of bodily harm and injury. Um, she also was accused of, and I think this is very interesting, of raising storms to delay the passage of a ship that had gone from Belfast to Air, stopped at Air, no doubt to pick up cargo, and then go all the way to Barbados. And apparently she had been seen floating in the waters just off the coast, sucking in the air um, like, a, like it was an udder. Uh, is how the records describe it. Um, and I think that's interesting, actually, this idea of witches as individuals who could interrupt the commerce of the town. The, the Cromwellian occupation had dampened Air's ability to trade normally. So anything that was threatened to that was, was really seen as a problem. Um, she had also challenged the authority of the Kirk some years back. Um, she had apparently, for example, threatened someone, one of the elders who had come by her home uh, on the Sabbath day and found her basically sleeping in and skipping church uh, and said some nasty things to him. Um, and then of course she was accused as so many witches were with renouncing her baptism and receiving the mark of the devil. And Sawyer was subjected um, like many other mid-century Scottish witches actually to this invasive and painful search for the devil's mark, which was believed to be an insensitive mark on the body. And, and there, there were professional witch prickers in Scotland who would go around with quite long needles to try and find that insensitive spot. Um, and witch prickers were really active at the end of the, the 1650s and into the early 1660s. So of course she was uh, executed as you might imagine based on how this story is going for the devilish art of witchcraft threatenings and menacing. That's the language from her trial. Um, 
the end of her case was described really vividly in a letter written by a, a guy called Robert Sowery, who'd been an English officer and heir during the Cromwellian occupation. And in this letter, he wrote about, you know, the Scots as a people who were, um, as he put it, more set against witchcraft than any other wickedness, right? He was sort of talking about the Scots as this people really invested in witch hunting. And in this story, he said that Sawyer, or in this letter, he said that Sawyer constantly denied witchcraft, right? Adair questioned her about it. And she said, no, no, I didn't do it. And Adair said, no, you must confess. And reportedly, um, in this last conversation with Adair, she said, quote, sir, I am shortly to appear before the judge of all the earth and a lie may damn my soul to hell. I am clear of witchcraft for which I am presently to suffer. Now I say supposed um, because I think this English officer had every reason to try in some ways portray the Scots as the sort of backwards people. You actually find a decent amount of this in some of the writings about Scotland during the time period that are, I think, sort of rooted in a certain level of sort of almost um, anti-Scottish sentiment that you do see prevailing among, among some English commentators. But I don't think we can, so I, I actually highly doubt that um, Sawyer actually said this, this, but nonetheless, I'm sure she had this conversation with with Adair. And we have every reason to believe this account um, in terms of just the anxiety that was being felt in the town and in Scotland in general at the time. You know, the community had just been invaded by soldiers. They felt in many cases that the end of the world was nigh. There was this eschatological excitement, right? Um, and again, that's certainly not to excuse any of it. This was horrific, but it helps us understand why it happened. Uh, soon after, Sawyer's conviction, Sloan and Elspeth Cunningham were also convicted um, for similar crimes. Um, they were both tried, burned, um, almost a sort of year after Sawyer was. Um, Sloan, for example, had a really large number of people testify against her, about 20, uh, 24 people, um, for things like cursing, magic, disorderly conduct. Um, Cunningham, like Sawyer, was subject to that really horrific search for the devil's, the devil's mark and also convicted um, for attending a witch's Sabbath in which the witches were plotting to disrupt the fishing activities in the village. Again, that economic anxiety. All right, I'm moving to wrap up here. Um, I've given you just, and I should say what happened to Janet Crawford. Um, she probably, she does not show up again in 1658. It's very likely that she died in the intervening years, which is why that fourth individual doesn't, doesn't get tried in, in 1658. Um, I do want to say that not everyone accused of witchcraft in air in the time period, even at the height of the Covenanters power was, um, ended up facing intense questioning and even death. Um, because accusations often started at the local level with your local Kirk session or your presbytery, these were known quantities, right? The people who were accused of witchcraft by their neighbors, even their loved ones, they weren't strangers to the session. They were often known, especially if they had a reputation, especially if they'd been hauled before the Kirk session before for some sort of crime, like playing dice on the Sabbath or drinking into the night with Cromwellian soldiers or whatever it may have been. Um, and, and not all, as I say, not all accusations were taken seriously. And just a, a brief example, um, in September of 1663, which occurred, which was a period right after really Scotland's largest witch hunt, which happens in 61 to 62, um, a woman called Agnes Dunshit appeared before the Kirk session at Ayr to complain that one of her neighbors, Marion McCall, had quote, slandered her good name by calling her a rank witch who should be burnt quick. Um, she had even, McCall had even accused poor Agnes of coming to her house on a Thursday night and bidding her to renounce her baptism. Now, this was a serious accusation, right? That actually is an ordinary person articulating what become, what is the sort of very elite concept of devilish witchcraft. And if taken seriously, right, it had the potential to cast enemies, these folks as enemies, not just of church and state, but of community and all of Christendom. But in this moment, the session judged M McCall guilty of slander. She was the one required to confess her sin before the congregation on the next Sabbath day. And Agnes's good name, for the time being anyway, was preserved. And I think 
you know, we, I think we have to think about why some people's accusations were taken more seriously than others and why some people were more vulnerable. Okay, just a few, a quick concluding thought. Um, taken together, the stories of the women we have discussed today, and I've really only given you a snapshot because I wanted us to sort of delve in. Um, they are, of course, only a fraction of the accused witches in Greater Ayrshire over the course of the early modern period. If we're thinking about the, the historic county of Ayr, um, you have about 150 people accused of witchcraft over the course of the entirety of the early modern period, so mostly between the late 16th and the, the 1660s. Um, but these stories remind us that the witch hunts in air and elsewhere really ought to be understood within the broader context of local and national anxieties and as part of a broader international story of witch hunting. Witch hunting didn't happen in a vacuum. It, it was a tragedy for sure, but it was not, as I mentioned before, an aberration. It was part of the broader project of eradicating sin, preventing divine wrath, and searching for stability, which was absolutely at the minds of covenanting leaders in Ayrshire at the time. And I think when we think about the covenanters, when we see their memorials or think about them as martyrs, we have to be clear that they were also avid witch hunters. Um, and during the chaos of the mid 17th century, sadly, uh, as is too often the case in history, mostly women paid the price. 